one of the advertisements at the beginning of a chapter literally said like where is all of the material coming for for us to 3d print this food you let us worry about that <laughs> and i was like mm, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. pref tech it just works Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I will be joined by Quentin Pongratz and Daniel J. Poole so we can talk about the graphic novel Let Go. Find the show notes for this episode of Second Opinion at thenexus.tv slash SO102. All right, so brief overview here of Let Go. What is it? It is a graphic novel um, about the growing pains of like a near future society that is approaching post scarcity. Quentin suggested this uh, graphic novel to me after listening to uh, our episode of The Extra Dimension about post scarcity um, because. Uh, he realized that this this is right in my wheelhouse, and uh, Quentin, you are absolutely right about that. I <laughs> I, re- <laughs> I really enjoyed like um, grappling with all of these ideas through through the format of a uh, of a graphic novel. Unfortunately, we can't really do like a spoiler free section versus a spoiler section uh, the way that we usually do when we're reviewing like books or movies or things like that because um, I mean everything that happens in the graphic novel are pretty important for like being able to discuss the issues that it's grappling with so if that concept sounds interesting to you uh i definitely recommend the the book it was it was really engaging um and i guess we're just gonna jump right in here right (laughs) yeah 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 my slug for the book was the automation of the atomic family Ooh. yeah I like that too because it, it, you know, atomic family just sounds super futuristic in this context as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, why don't you two introduce yourselves as well, just so people can uh, recognize your voices? Sure. I'm Daniel, and I'm over on Double Issue. We've been on a hiatus, and soon to be Chapter Chaps. And my name is Quentin Pongratz, and I'm host of the much more successful Third Opinions podcast. (laughs) We review every episode of Second Opinions. If somebody thought it was worth doing that for one of my shows, I would be so thrilled. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so the authors of Let Go, um, they, um, I guess they're mostly known for making a podcast of their own called Reviewed the Future. Um, Quentin, you're more familiar with them than I am. Uh, is that fair to say? Uh, that's how, well, John Perry, uh, one of the authors, makes games. Um, he made a few board games that I'm familiar with, Time Time Barons and Airland and Sea. That's how I found him. And then I found that he has a podcast with Ted cupper ted cupper and they have a podcast called review the future and i got into that because it's very similar vibes to uh your podcast nice and i was like hey i i could go with more of that (laughs) and apparently they are about to uh switch up the format of their podcast um when they hit episode 100 which uh, is their next episode so that that's probably a good time for me to just jump on because then i won't have any baggage yeah yeah uh, and they uh, they funded this um, this graphic novel through a Kickstarter campaign. Um, when did that run? Uh, I want to say I have it up. So 2016. Cool. Looks like okay. Yeah. So yeah, it is it is important I think to note that uh, the the analysis you know that they're they're coming at all of these issues from a perspective that's a few years old. Um, not too old, but you know some of the stuff that they that they show in this uh, graphic novel. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, we kind of do. We're, we're kind of making our way towards that already. Um, and some things yeah. are like already here. <laughs> All right, so let's jump into talking about the book itself. Um, so this book follows a family of four, um, and each person in the family is kind of. Um, they provide like a different lens through which we are seeing these changes in society. Um, so Dan is the dad and he prides himself in being able to like get work done and providing for his family, stuff like that. 
Um, Jen, the mom, uh, she really highly like values family. Um, she's kind of the helicopter parent, right? She's always like watching her her kids and and seeing what they do. Um, and so we we get to see uh, some aspects of like you know. What, what technology can can allow parents to do in terms of like yeah doing surveillance on their children um that was definitely not possible when i was a kid yeah <laughs> uh olivia's the daughter um she's 16 at the beginning of the book which means that she's probably like 17 or 18 by the end of the book um because yeah. it spans like two years i think uh, something like that about. Yeah. Um, and she's uh, really obsessed with like her social ranking. Um, in the book, they call it stats. Um, Aiden is the son. I'm assuming that he was like in junior high at the beginning of the book because he seems like he's the younger of the two, but they don't really address his exact age. Yeah. He seems a little um, younger, though. Yeah. Um, and he's uh, basically his deal is that he's always, he's constantly playing like VR games. Yeah. Um, and then there is uh, a fifth member of the family, I guess, the grandpa, who yeah. is, he's in a coma for most of the book, but he, he does come around, uh, he, he wakes up towards the end of the book, and uh, at that point, he does provide a new perspective, which is like, oh my gosh, I've, all these technologies are amazing, <laughs> what, what do any of you have to be sad about? Because like, we just, we have everything now. <laughs> the future is magic. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, to be fair, is, like, probably how I would feel if I went to sleep right now and then, like, woke up in the world that they are living in. Yeah. I mean, that's still how my dad feels about it. He's like, this is science fiction. Yeah. And he's not wrong. No. <laughs> I mean, not even going to sleep. The The progress in this book from page one to page whatever the end is, is... It's like a singularity curve, I think, is what they're, <laughs> yeah, for sure they're doing. Because each time the time skips forward, it it kind of halves, and technology has still progressed. Yeah, and like each each kind of new chapter in the book, they like the the cover page for that chapter. They have like whatever the new technology is. They have like basically an advertisement for that. So it progresses from like, hey, you can have like these augmented reality glasses, and then like uh, six months later, it's like, hey, you can have augmented reality contact lenses. You don't even need to wear glasses anymore. And then like two months after that, they're like, whatever, everything's just connected to your brain. Uh, I like that that the chapters are even named one year later, four months later, four days later, eight hours, fifteen minutes. Yeah, it's just nice. Calm down. So some of the uh, post-scarcity issues that are explored in this book uh, include like, the fact that unenhanced humans can't compete in the job market. Um, they, they portray this in the form of like they're, they're just like pills that you can take to kind of make, your, make you smarter, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the dad is struggling with like, you know, wh whether he wants to go that route or not in order to, uh, in order to stay in the job market one at one point tries them and has a bad reaction yeah <laughs> until their son brings him his <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> yeah i i love that the dad was like trying to go through the official channels and he ends up like having a bad trip <laughs> and then and then his son who's in like junior high is just like here dad here's the good stuff yeah <laughs> um what's the name of the one of them's named excelson and one's called noah tall noah tall there yeah. we go there was another one like Neurosin or something, but Noah Tall is my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. All all of the technologies in here have great names. <laughs> there's like there there's also uh, Neurotics, but I prefer to think of it as Neurotics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's also like a lot of just like little things in the backgrounds of the panels that like if you're paying attention, you'll be like, oh, oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty funny. <laughs> But it's not, like, directly a part of the story itself. Yeah. Right. Though I think some of that is key to, like, following what's going on mm. in the book. Because at times it does seem to go by super fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wise. So if you aren't paying attention to the background stuff, it seems to go by even faster. <laughs> and especially, like, there, there are some scenes that just, like, 
there's like a lot happening visually all at once. Mm-hmm. Like um, the the prom scene where everybody's outfits are changing yeah. throughout the scene. And I was just like, who, which characters are what? And like, you know, even like their hairstyles are changing. So it's like, who is who? <laughs> oh man, that was really trippy because they're, the their AI is controlling the changing of their clothes and they set it up. So it's trying to guess the next trend before it happens and then reacting to that. It, yeah. I was trying to think yeah. through that. <laughs> Just man, and you know that kind of thing has has never gone wrong before. <laughs> like, <laughs> Doesn't go wrong here. <laughs> nah, the stock market just eyeing us from behind some hedges. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also just thinking of like really simple examples of like um, like third party sellers on Amazon that use just like automated systems to set their prices like you know 10 percent lower than like the next lowest one or something like that you know Mm. and sometimes you have two different bots that are just like optimizing for for kind of the same thing and then they end up like playing off of each other and like making the price like you know rock bottom or whatever yeah i think that that happens a lot in the stock market where there'll be micro micro crashes where machines will just do that and it'll be like a blip on the stock radar (laughs) because they've they they do it all the way down and then and then it recovers. And then some, immediately. Somebody gets wiser. Yeah. 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 I had I tried to buy something on Amazon and I forget what it was. It's probably like an old game. But I think that it happened is the price had been artificially lowered to like ten cents. And I was like, Okay, I'll buy a game for ten cents. And then the seller afterwards just sent me an email. I was like, uh, that item's out of stock and you can buy it now for thirty dollars. It's just hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how you build trust. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Automation. It's great and terrible. <laughs> and also I guess in that in that circumstance, the sellers are not in a place where they have to really build trust with us because how many of us even remember like which third party sellers we're getting things from through Amazon? Yeah. You know, we, we we're just thinking of it as getting it from Amazon. I yeah. mean, I've kind of built up like three or four booksellers I like getting from on Amazon. But okay. that's only because I work at a library now. <laughs> so I have to pay more attention to that. So speaking of libraries and like educational settings, um, another one of the issues that they address is like, what is the purpose of education in a world where like <laughs> employment is unnecessary? Um, and they like they go pretty hard at that right away in the book where um, Aiden is like he gets caught in school for cheating on a test and he's like, he doesn't care. He's just like, just punish me and get it over with because nothing that we're doing here in this school is even getting me ready for the real world. Like, I'm not going to have a job when I grow up. Nobody's going to have a job when, when by the time I grow up. Like, none of this matters. And that's kind of something that, like, I personally, Ian Buck, have have <laughs> struggled with as well as a teacher. I'm like, well, okay, I need to really think about what am I trying to bring to my students? Am I, like my philosophy is definitely not to just like prepare them for a particular job, you know, like I'm not, I'm not pursuing like, Ooh, I I need to get them like the Cisco networking certification because you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but kind of trying to think about like, what do my students need to know about computer tech to like live their everyday lives and be digital citizens. But it's also like how much of that does actually matter if they're not using computers for work, if there's no work, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think about that a lot because I work in the makerspace for the library. Mm. And so my whole job is trying to like guess what the next useful skill will be. And after a while of that, I was like, you know what? These kids like to knit. We're just going to get some knitting needles. We're not going <laughs> to we're not going to try too hard to like rationalize it as like oh well they're going to need to know how to use this kind of uh, bindery jet uh, 3d pr- uh, printer we should just do something that they'll have a new skill for <laughs> instead because the market just changes so rapidly on that kind of technology yeah yeah and that's why i teach my students how to make podcasts because <laughs> like i don't know i feel i feel like if you're going to be making a podcast today you're probably not doing it for money yeah. And in the future, if you're making a podcast, you're also not going to be doing it for money. Yeah. 
Some people are, but the vast majority of us who are making podcasts are not doing it. We're not making, we're not, we're not getting rich. Go to patreon.com slash nexus TV and support <laughs> this podcast today. Yeah. Speaking of support, like how, how does a society support those who can no longer work? That's another issue that's uh, explored in the book at the beginning of the book. Like, it's it's a it seems like they just have a pretty conventional like unemployment benefits mm-hmm. you know like for one year after you lose your job you can you know receive some checks from the government um but then like at at the end of that that's it um a little bit later in the book like i think it's about a quarter of the way through the book then they start to talk about like well you know everything's just like so cheap now because there aren't any humans mm-hmm. part of the production line so nobody has to get paid to make these things and so, like, we can all, like, even though none of us are making much money, we can still afford cheap stuff. Um, yeah. And they've even got the, like, right after right after he says he's got one year of benefits, the next scene is them moving out of their house because mm-hmm. he still doesn't have a job. And where they're moving into is ad-subsidized housing. Yeah. Which is... <laughs> I thought of Amazon when I read that part yeah. because, you know, they have those like ad subsidized um, smartphones that you can buy uh, from yeah, Amazon yeah. and they have, yeah, they have advertisements on the lock screen. Mm, yeah. They, they do that with the, the Kindle as well. You can get a ad yep. one and make it a little cheaper. Yeah. We were looking at buying tablets for some students and we were looking through and we were like, oh, these ones are cheap and had to look at the ad subsidized like, oh, are we allowed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's a no-no in yeah. an educational setting. It's wild. But the idea of an ad-subsidized house made me a little scared because I know that's where we're <laughs> oh, heading yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think the scariest parts of this book are capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. Well, and But if- I, I also kind of have to wonder, like, if, if we're in a world where nobody's working and like you know i guess we're we're still like buying things but like you know rampant consumerism can't be the norm in that kind of setup i would imagine so like how many advertisements are there going to be if like everything's super cheap anyway yeah do we need to subsidize things with ads i don't know how <laughs> effective are ads going to be if nobody has any money yeah well, yeah that just feels like a like a balloon or a hangover from Mm. people who hadn't quite adjusted yet because i was like yeah what are they paying for if all they need are a pair of smart glasses and smart clothes yeah well by the end i think maybe there is just one company (laughs) well yeah (laughs) oh (laughs) it gets pretty radical at the end (laughs) there like all the buildings are rebranded yeah yeah (laughs) which is (laughs) I was kind of hoping, like, yeah, when they had that scene where he's, like, looking at the skyline and he's like, they're rebuilding the entire city. I was like, I I need some details on that. I want (laughs) to know exactly what the urban fabric of this area is going to be afterwards. Like, what are they doing? Yeah. I mean, hopefully. What are they changing? They just loaded in that guy's SimCity, like the perfect SimCity. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they... In some ways, they wouldn't even have to rebuild. They just need to rebuild it once. And after that, they can use whatever hologram technology they're using for everything else. Yeah. 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 Just change the city on a whim. Maybe they're not actually building anything. Maybe they're just like, you know, flattening everything so that everybody's walking around and they don't have any physical <laughs> objects that they can accidentally bump into because we're just going to be make, like making everything via holograms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes from the uncanonical Star Wars novels is they had a mm. 3D printer building and it would like chop up a building and draw it inside of its body and then behind it leave a fully new printed building out of the material. And nice. they just mention it offhandedly as Luke's watching it go through the city and it's like, can we get a whole book on that? <laughs> I don't really <laughs> care about Jedis right now. <laughs> Uh, another issue is like w- how do people derive their self worth like where what makes us feel like we are important in a world where we're not actually working um I feel like the three of us are probably the wrong people to ask <laughs> since like 
you know, we have a lot of creative work that we're doing already that is not tied to, uh, you know, making a living. Um, but it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't strike me that that's going to be like a huge societal problem because it, it seems like most people are good at like just kind of generating their own purpose. Yeah. Um, and like, even in the, even in the novel, in the graphic novel, like we have like one character who is just like, no, I need a job. I am somebody who, you know, has to be working. Um, what do they call him? I'm a struggler. Right. And, um, pretty much everybody else in the book was like, Dan, what are you doing? (laughs) Just, you know? (laughs) Well, yeah. Cause like there's a guy that I work with and he's always talking about how important his job in the oil field is and how important it is and how it's like fulfilling to him to keep working. And then like anytime there's a depression, he's like, I'm going to go practice guitar. (laughs) (laughs) It's like a light switch for him. It's like, yep, uh, this is more time to go learn how to do some more songs. Yeah. But I do identify with the Dan of the book because I always feel like I'm like, being wasteful if i don't do something but i write terrible fiction or i don't know go practice an instrument or something if i'm not at a job so yeah i feel like there's ways to get that but he doesn't get that in the book (laughs) necessarily but also i struggle with uh the possible future of this is i think there's always stuff you can find to do and uh you could even be helping your community if you didn't have a job but at a certain point they've got like a lot of drones at least in this book that could be doing all of those things so you couldn't even like help out your neighbors because you would be doing worse than something automated would be doing (laughs) yeah so like in in terms of like physically helping uh, in that kind of sense yeah for sure um but I, i also think about like a lot of the activism that i do in the local politics here in the twin cities and i'm like i could that be done by machines i like that doesn't even yeah m- make sense to me because it's like uh really really the the work that i'm doing there is is uh working against other human forces who don't want bike lanes and you know i'm helping to organize the people who do want bike lanes and like if i if i want to um reduce uh you know bike advocacy to just that issue uh (laughs) and so it's like you know i mean we can't really like have just like two sides that are just like robots arguing with each other over whether we should have bike lanes um yeah because that's unless unless like the government suddenly is just like well we're gonna make decisions not based on what people want anymore but based on what machines want yeah and i don't even know how to interface with that kind of world yeah but could we imagine two picket lines of chappy robots and they all have like tv screens on sticks that they're yelling at each other (laughs) and then like mid protest they all stop blink out and the like branding changes and they have a new strike (laughs) (laughs) yeah i think that that is part of it is that there's not going to be just some end state utopia place but it's going to be like wow it's pretty good we can work to you know advocate to make this better for people that aren't being you know treated fairly by the system or here's the thing the system did not think about or whatever let's advocate against that because even if there's something that can generate all the ideas as (laughs) becomes part of the end part of this book (laughs) you can generate people's ideas based on their their profile (laughs) Mm -hmm. um there wouldn't be the advocation for them it would be the system just like i guess weighing outcomes and deciding i don't know striving for an even better future all elections will be done by facebook polls oh lord (laughs) (laughs) did you read uh what's it no no mon g-n-o-m-o-n that has like no that has like micro voting as part of its dystopia future (laughs) where like all the citizens or maybe selected citizens just vote on like minutia like all times of the day Mm. i did watch the orville episode where trials are carried out by social media voting (laughs) (laughs) 
the end game is that all all local elections are held on next door. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're we're electing city council members, but I want to talk about a strange person I saw walking outside <laughs> in jogging clothes. But yeah, I th- I think it, there I'm not sure if there's like a perfect state that exists that we can achieve, but even if there is, I think it might be so fundamentally different. Rethinking purpose might just not be impossible from the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can definitely like the as I'm talking about, you know, like how do we make decisions in a world like this? Like I can definitely feel that, like, okay, I just I because I am not in this world, I don't have a way to interface with this world and understand it so (laughs) well i think that's partially what makes me a little uneasy reading the end of the book (laughs) it's because to me sitting back here in the past i'm thinking that's a bad idea right like we shouldn't be taking us a pill to make you happier and then i had to step outside and it's like okay but by that time that's actually going to be a a better way forward for them because of the things presented in the whole book. I don't know. Uh, I just sit yeah. and think about this book for a long time after I finished it the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the whole like, and everybody takes their happy pills <laughs> has been like fed to us time and time again as like, wow, isn't this just like the ultimate dystopia because like everybody thinks that it's great because they've been taking their happy pills, but like things are actually terrible. Um, but like, yeah, re- reading this book, it's like, Oh, that does sound nice. Yeah, no, that seems good. <laughs> and, you know, I have to also remember that, like, it's something like 70% of the people I work with are on some form of, uh, like, serotonin or um, antidepressant. I was like, oh, right. <laughs> like, this is a part of our health now. It's not, like, the yeah. 60s dystopian view of it. Yeah. I, the ending still makes me uneasy. I don't know how to feel about it. <laughs> because it feels like it's just like all like there's like an uneasiness with everything throughout the whole book because everyone's you know unhappy in various ways and it's kind of exploring those and the technologies and so it feels except for that one guy who is like the manager at their apartment (laughs) complex man he he is making the most of everything (laughs) joe and meryl's dad are just having their best lives yes I do love that, like, yeah, Meryl's dad just pops up over and over <laughs> again, even even when, um, like, Dan and Jen are in their own little <laughs> VR space, like, just, ha- like, living out this fantasy of, like, making out as high schoolers at a party or whatever. <laughs> and, wait, isn't that Meryl's dad? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to mention that Joe, the building manager, comes out to help Dan move in. And I thought, oh, he's going to grab a box. He's like, here, I brought a dolly. And it's like a Roomba dolly that just automated and walks up to him to accept the package. It's like, oh, (laughs) right. Yeah. I mean, why not? Yeah. I mean, I've moved enough people around houses. I would appreciate it. Yeah. And like that's, I think that's something that this book doesn't directly address is that like in most of these scenarios, it's like you, you, you have tools available to you that allow you to not have to do this work if you don't want to, but you totally could do it if you really wanted to, you know, like you could carry that box up to the elevator and go up to your, to your, um, apartment. Um, you know, they've, they've got the, uh, the 3d printer that like, you know, just prints out a a fully cooked chicken or whatever. (laughs) And it's like, I mean, you could cook, you could cook a chicken if that's your passion, if you like doing that. But you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, and, you know, that's, I mean, that's kind of beautiful. Yeah. I guess the one thing that you're not allowed to do anymore is drive a car, <laughs> which I am 100% behind. Yeah. No, I like that they have self driving cars from the start. Like Dan even has to yeah. sit in the passenger seat. And they're all called Auto Auto. <laughs> so perfect. Just call an auto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess I, that, that does bring up, uh, in my mind, one of the things that they didn't really address, which is like the environmental impacts of, of any of these things, you know, it's like, okay, if we, if we 
have a world where it's like super cheap to just like hop in a self-driving car and you don't even have to own the self-driving car you know you just you just pay a subscription or whatever um and it's like well na- like now we're incentivizing people to use not like the most energy efficient system which would be like oh i'll ride a bike or i will go and you know get on a bus or whatever like if everybody's in their own like little uh self-driving pods it's like yeah. you know is like i mean it's it's probably all electric by that point and everything but you know have have we hand waved away all of those issues by like oh we're just using uh uh renewable resources for everything um you know it's it's it, you know it can't 100 percent be renewable because like the earth is a finite piece of rock yeah. you know and like we, we we will eventually run out of matter uh that we're trying to use to like build these things um yeah so like how do how do we limit ourselves how you know how do we find the the balance uh in an environment where it's like where individual people don't have to see the the limits like the monetary limits of getting all of this these physical items the camera yeah. starts zooming back from the last panel and it goes up into space and it's just the expanse just oh no <laughs> we've propped up our entire civilization on slavery yeah uh i this is where i still don't know how i feel about this book <laughs> uh is i can't determine where it sits with technology because the only downsides it portrays is like the human psychology downsides of some of this and not the ramifications environmentally or even like surely people are getting left behind in this at least for times in these technologies like the the future is not evenly distributed <laughs> right like in our world there's still so many places that don't have access to high speed internet which is like a necessity <laughs> For this world right now and there's still so many places without it and it i'm not sure how to like i know that what they're going for is like trying to like look at how technology could go and not necessarily the cd underside of all of it but i'm not sure how i feel yeah. with it not touching on any of that stuff at all the the closest it seemed to get was the scene where they're meeting with like they're they're going out to dinner with Dan's cousin and his girlfriend mm-hmm. and they were they were talking about like oh yeah we've got all this synthetic meat that's cool like hey look at my girlfriend she's 26 but like she looks like she's 18 because um you know all this anti-aging at the cellular level and stuff you should check out this clinic like they they do <laughs> great work and i thought to myself like Okay, but if Dan and Jen don't have jobs, and this cousin does, like, he's clearly making more money than they do. That's mm-hmm. why they're going to him for help. Like, can they actually afford the anti-aging that that clinic is offering? Uh, and that wasn't made clear in the book, but it did make me, make me kind of wonder, like, oh, yeah, what it, like, how far is the disparity in terms of, like, who has resources and who does not? Yeah. And this follows like a family that seems to be comfortably middle class at the beginning. And then they at least slide a little bit without his employment. But they seem to be caught by, you know, a safety net there. Um, Yeah, because Joe makes the comment when he's moving into the building of you don't have a job, but you have a house and food. And Dan's like, is that supposed to make me feel better or something like that? It's like, (laughs) I mean, yes, because that's (laughs) not what you would have right now. Yeah. But yeah, I think as far as that goes, it's nice that they dig in so much further into the psychology of people dealing with technology, since so much sci-fi does deal with mainly the eco- ecological outcomes. Like that was the thing I was thinking about watching a lot of Star Trek the last couple of days. Is Star Trek is so involved with the ecology of everything they do? Well, I'm watching Deep Space Nine, and they talk a lot about like. The different systems on board the space station to keep things involved or keep things working they talk a lot about like plants and mm. so i just thought it was interesting 
reading this and then almost never mentioning any plants or farming or anything like that. Right. Like one of the uh, one of the advertisements at the beginning of a chapter literally said, like, where is all of the material coming for for us to 3D print this food? You let us worry about that. <laughs> and I was like, mm, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. prep tech. It mm-hmm. just works. And so <laughs> that's also part of what makes the ending very uncomfortable for me is that it's not like it's like limiting your unhappiness, your dissatisfaction. They all take that happy pill. And uh, and I'm just, is this to not see, feel dissatisfaction or is this part of like the facade to not see, not see the cracks where there are cracks yeah. in society to ignore, you know, like suffering of others perhaps? <laughs> well, and I had to think about if everyone's out of a job basically, but they don't really need things. This is going to be that growth or that growing pains for society as they make that final step over past the singularity. So maybe this is just a stopgap pill (laughs) to get people into the new society. I mean, hopefully it's not a Logan's run situation where then they never do anything else ever again after that. But who knows? Maybe the pref tech AI decides that's what's (laughs) best for everyone. (laughs) And no one disagrees because they're all on the happy pills. (laughs) They're all too busy doing like stupid dances for each other <laughs> in their living rooms. Getting points at, you know, walrus video games, egg collecting. <laughs> and, and like that's that's the thing is like not only were the people in that scene like not unhappy anymore, but they also were just like like connecting with each other and being super nice to each other. Yeah. You know, in a way that they hadn't been before. And it was like <laughs> Yeah, you know, Aiden, I would love to meet your online girlfriend. Really? Yeah, I think we would really, you know, get along. And it's like, why couldn't we have done this from the start, you guys? Because <laughs> it, cause it was things they were feeling, but were too, you know, scared or whatever to say. Because you're worrying about, you know, how wrong it could go. Mm-hmm. Well, that was worrying me about the mom, uh, Jen, is that she's watching her daughter's entire life through social media. And then even their cyber fantasy is a fantasy from her life, from the daughter's life. And uh, the whole time I was just, but Jen, you can just go do things. Like, you could go be doing these things that your daughter's doing. You could be Meryl's dad. (laughs) You could go see Meryl's dad. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, like, I I don't blame her for, like, trying to use VR to, like, explore other sexual fantasies with her husband oh, yeah. you know like that seems perfectly reasonable um because you know some like i mean some things might not be possible for you in the physical world um though by the end of the book i i get the feeling that just about anything <laughs> would have been possible uh for them yeah. you know in terms of like oh yeah uh, her dad who was in a coma and like looked like he was already a corpse hey now he's like this uh i don't know blonde buff dude uh (laughs) he looks like he fell out of a 1950s movie like he looks perfectly healthy and happy (laughs) one i did love that too is like the doctor says you know hey your your dad's ready to go and she's like what like shouldn't it be a couple hours it's like no he's up and walking around yeah that conversation was super weird to me because she was like wait he's ready to go now and they were like yep see you soon and it's like wait she did not say that she was coming over to pick him up (laughs) It's. <laughs> the, I think this book suffers a little bit from being how short it is with how much it's trying to do. There are so many yeah, scenes that fly by that are a little bit hard to make sense of yeah. if you don't slow down and reread it because of how fast it goes sometimes. Well, yeah, there were some things yeah. with um, the dad's job search that the first time I didn't really give it a lot of thought, but he gets a message that's like, hey, you have a job interview in 17 minutes, and it's like counting down. Yeah. So he leaves Aiden's school to just go to the job interview, and they walk in. It's like, sorry, we only have five minutes to do this interview. And the first time I read that, I was like, oh, that seems correct. And then rereading it today, I was like, wait, this is horrifying and terrible. <laughs> it's not how you should be doing job interviews. Yeah, it's not only and uh, not only five minutes. It's, oh, we're giving it to my sister, but we just have to do job interviews. <laughs> Wow, yeah. That is cousin or something. (laughs) 
that is how we do interviews right now. Yeah, you no, know, that is, that is very <laughs> real right now. <laughs> for for me, coming at it from a you know spring of twenty twenty perspective, um, I saw that that scene and I was like, "You have an interview in seventeen minutes." I'm like, "Okay, cool." He's gonna go and like open up Skype on his <laughs> computer uh, because we're not allowed to like be around other people. Yeah. Oh no, he's going all the way there to do it in person. Oh yeah, that's not very good social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and they even call that kind of interview something special, like this is a live chat or something like that. Yeah, so, like this is just to get to know your vibe. <laughs> yeah, they did say vibe. That was perfectly <laughs> on time. Uh, I did notice that, like with the augmented reality glasses and things like that, that they are able to have, you know, like instant messaging um, with other people who are like physically present. And it's, you know, like, like it's completely private at that point. You know, you don't have to like pretend, you know, you don't have to like pull out your phone surreptitiously Mm, to like message the person who's sitting next to you kind of thing without everybody else noticing. Um, so I mean that's definitely that's definitely on its way. That's that's a technology that 100% we're going to have. Um also it really amused me that like they had this this uh digital assistant who is like helping you to like analyze yeah the way that other people are speaking and I don't know it felt like it felt like LA Noir or something yeah. where it's just like tool tips that are telling you like how to read other people's body language it's like video game stats well it's very much like uh oh what was the one disco elysium mm. in that one your stats talk to you so in that one you could succeed a skill check passively and it'll be like seems like this person is lying to you so it's very much like that but offloaded from your brain and into the digital brain and i i also thought about like there was there was one scene where I think it was when Dan had like done some planning for the vacation and she was asking Jen was asking like how did you find this place and he was like oh you know I was just checking out some vids and her her assistant told her like I think he's holding something back <laughs> and then like she responds by just going huh and his assistant which has the exact same avatar you know <laughs> is the same assistant uh program mm-hmm said i think she's on to you and i'm like okay are there assistants talking to each other like (laughs) a hundred percent (laughs) yes and like and and if that's the case then like who's good are they working for (laughs) obviously the company that made them because this is capitalism (laughs) we've got to keep them on that vacation because they'll spend way more money on vacation yeah it's very true (laughs) uh it just reminded me that i was reading a book that has um, assistive glasses. And it was really awkward, though, in this book because it'll read someone's emotion and tell you just a static emotion at the bottom. So he's like, they are angry. Just, oh, thanks. I picked that up from context clues, but... (laughs) (laughs) So I did not realize when he uh, takes the brain pills the first time and he's, Mm -hmm. like, going through all of his contacts to figure out how he can get a job. I did not realize the wall filling up with advertisements as he searches more and more. <laughs> I just thought that was like oh, parts really? of his searches. I was oh. not reading that correctly. It's like the the ad on his wall is like, hey, here's some stocks or you have to be a genius to get this joke. <laughs> Oh yeah, I did and, see like, that. All of yeah. that. And by the end there's a whole lot more. So I thought it was like his his Google searches or whatever as he was like going through, but now that I'm looking at it it's as you're doing more in your room the ads are like context sensitive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which makes it even worse. <laughs> like when he prop when he popped the brain pills an ad for brain teasers is on the wall. Like these work great yeah. with smart pills. I definitely when he when he was like suddenly getting into the zone of like you know show me all my contacts now cross reference them this way you know I was expecting him to say like zoom enhance <laughs> zoom enhance yeah. <laughs> one thing that I think we haven't talked a whole lot about is like Olivia's angle um which is like the the social stats mm. you know um and they've they've like I mean they've they've taken what we worry about in our current 
lives, which is like, you know, how many followers do I have on Twitter? How many uh, subscribers do I have on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. And just like, just boil it down to a single number um, that seems like not clearly tied to any <laughs> any one thing anymore. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard to know what exactly it means. Um, but yeah, she's she at the beginning of the, the book doesn't seem super invested in them but like very quickly uh starts doing like everything she can to boost her stats um which i admit is uh something that i have done a non-negligible amount of thought (laughs) on in my real life (laughs) yeah i didn't like the fact that i was in that picture i'd like to report it (laughs) I uh, know Olivia's arc makes me feel very uncomfortable because that is something that doing creative work you have to do. Yeah, yeah, but for sure. But also at the same time it it can be really bad if you get too into it because like she set up a uh, like an accidental naked picture and then it's like a year later she's like skinny dipping at parties to get more points and then yeah. Whenever it got to the paid sponsorship watching, I was just, no, it's too real now, Roy. <laughs> yeah. And like, I was, I was expecting in some way, you know, the whole issue of like her using her body for that and she's like a minor, you know, I was expecting that to come yeah. back later on, but it never does. It, it, you know, it never bites her in the butt. And that, um, it felt uncomfortable to me seeing them make those choices, but then the fact that there was no repercussions, I was like, "Oh right, this is the future where I guess that doesn't matter now." As far as like it's yeah. so normal, and like like always, the thing that really got me was like she was always thinking about um, like I can't be associated with people who have a much lower stat than I do because that'll bring me down. Which kind of makes me like it. It makes me feel about like, ah, oh, my neighbor over there is doing stuff to their yard that is like <laughs> bringing the value of my own house down. Um, but yeah, I did just pull up all three of our our Twitter accounts, and um, I'm sorry, Quentin, but you have less than 400 followers, so I think we're gonna have to kick you out of the podcast episode. I can't we're all even on here with you, <laughs> man. <laughs> uh, I I used to run. Uh, what I called a no tier literary fiction blog, and I would post okay. like just the absolute lowest, just getting started writers. And my idea was like, this is your first time, like your first shot. And it got popular enough that I had like over a thousand people on Twitter, and I was like, man, I am so cool because of this. <laughs> and now that I use Twitter personally, not for that company, and only have like four hundred or something, like I feel so much better now. <laughs> <laughs> now that i'm not giving as much time to that did did that mostly have an effect on just like the way that you were approaching like thinking about the things that you posted or did it did it have more of an effect on like man the the replies that i'm getting on all of my <laughs> posts really suck when i have this many followers uh, so this was a little earlier in twitter's history so it wasn't i'm trying to think I didn't get a lot of replies because most of my followers were like other brands following the brand. <laughs> and so it's basically just a lot of bots <laughs> responding to me. Um, but now that I actually just use it for personal most of the time, like uh, I don't have the pressure to make a post every so many hours like I did. Mm. And so taking that little bit of pressure off feels better. Not that I should be ignoring <laughs> my branded Twitter accounts, but um yeah when i was trying trying to think like oh this is my corporate account so i need to think about my image my brand and now it's like here's some bread i made <laughs> enjoy i can't relate to this conversation oh <laughs> <laughs> you're doing really good at twitter though <laughs> you're getting more interactions than i do i have thought about the fact that like man on my on my twitter account most of the people who I interact with and honestly most of, like the posts that I put up there are like biking related or other transportation stuff you know and none of my podcasts directly 
capitalize on like that momentum. And I feel like I'm really missing out on an opportunity there. Um, but that's a thing for me to worry about <laughs> and figure out. Hey everyone, this episode's about bikes. Come on over. <laughs> I mean, as of the recording time, most of the upcoming episodes of <laughs> Second Opinion are going to be about bike equipment. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I review Let Go as zero stars for no bikes. No bikes in this book. No bikes. Zero stars. <laughs> Are there no bikes? Yeah. I didn't see any. It it was definitely it was definitely um very focused on like the future of, of self driven cars as as our one and only transportation mode. Although I assume that the high low or whatever that was that he took mm-hmm. to to get to the vacation spot, I assume that, that was like a hyperloop kind of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, man. Just noticed that mm-hmm. looking at the shot on the beach, two people are taking a selfie with, like, a camera that's just floating. <laughs> <laughs> they, like, put their phone in that... drone mode or something. That'll never be possible. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I like all these little... That's the thing I really like about the book, because I like all these little, tiny technology prediction yeah. things. Oh, they're, like... Even things as as like simple as I saw a billboard that said like, oh yeah, Times Person of the Year, and it named the digital assistant. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, 100%, the- that is something that Time Magazine would do. <laughs> and they've got uh, self-applying makeup. She just puts a little bit uh-huh. on and it covers her whole face. Uh, I really want that or want them to explain that is it like nanobots that are coated in makeup that just it's gotta be they they do they do casually reference nanites yeah. in the book yeah. at one point there's a lot of like you know yeah futurism concepts that are just kind of c- casually thrown out yeah. there but not really grappled with in the book which is fine because like yeah the book's focus was on the societal impacts of all of this stuff yeah um there was there was one one conversation, one line in the book that, like, I felt like it really kind of encapsulated the entire thesis of the book. Um, it was, uh, like, I think this was at one point where Dan was, like, you know, going through his job uh, hunting process, and there's a couple of women who are just, like, walking by, and he overhears this conversation, mm-hmm. and one of them is saying, Overriding the hedonic treadmill turns out to be the wieldy part. The trick is compressing the dynamic range without obliterating it. And I was like, yeah, one hundred percent. That's yep. There it is. <laughs> oh, they're talking about the happy pill, aren't they? They're they're talking about like just the kind of overall. We need to get rid of this feeling that everybody has that like okay, I always have to be striving for more. So that's that's the talking about overriding the hedonic treadmill. Um, and then when she's saying like the trick is compressing the dynamic range without obliterating it, um, the only reason that I understand that sentence is because I know what like dynamic range is when you're processing audio, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is you know so if you're compressing the dynamic range, then you are taking like the quieter parts and making them louder without making the loud parts louder. So you're you're bringing like the overall the difference in volume, you're reducing that. That's the dynamic range. And so I assume there that she's talking about like, we're, we're trying to reduce the difference between the people with resources, what they can get, you know, in terms of like physical goods versus what people who don't have as many resources. Basically, she's saying that we have to reduce inequality, but in really fancy words. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but Dan only cares about the fact of that they're taking Excelsin. Like that's what he's focused in on. Yes, it's like if I took that, I yeah, that was that was the plot point <laughs> of the the scene. <laughs> but um, the dressing there is that the authors, I feel like, they put their thesis right there <laughs> <laughs> as dialogue. Yeah. Oh, how do you guys feel about the employee test when he applies for a job? Oh yeah, <laughs> he goes in and it's a I mean, it's a <laughs> test where we only see one question of it, but it says, "Is this box mostly?" Red or orange are the options given. <laughs> and I love that this is in a graphic novel that is entirely black oh, and yeah, white. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it just, it's that, it's that algorithm deciding things. And it's like, we, the algorithm has decided that these are the best questions to ask, like the most efficient way. Because whether they think this is red or orange correlates with this other quality that we really need. <laughs> And we can get it more efficiently just by asking this one question. 
And see, that kind of cracks me up from my time when I was doing assessment because kids would get really mad. They'd be like, when in real life am I ever going to need to do fractions? I'm like, it's not the fact that you have to do fractions. It's the fact that if you can think through how to do this problem with fractions, we can assess that you have a, a better time at taking a math class. And they're always just, oh, whatever. This isn't real world. I was like, these aren't even like the most accelerated or like the most streamlined questions. <laughs> We're trying to make these look look like questions you would expect, much less the ones that actually work. I have kind of the opposite issue in some of my classes where like students come in expecting that like computer tech, oh, it's just going to be about like my my technical uh, skills and everything. And then like I'm having them write essays about like the social and ethical <laughs> implications of some of these technologies. And they're like, I have to write? What the <laughs> heck is this? Man, computer programming students get so mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you do have to talk to humans sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah i'm like i'm sorry but you you'll need to be able to write an essay in yeah. your life <laughs> but yeah uh do we have any other pressing thoughts on this book because we've gone about an hour and uh that that was pretty much everything that i wanted to talk no, about i think i've covered everything what what did you guys like general vibe you like it dislike it I like it. It gave me a very like kind of human window into thinking about a lot of these topics that like, you know, up until reading this book, I had been thinking of them in abstract terms, you know, in large like societal trends. But then, you know, getting this like microcosm of what that could look like, um, definitely useful. Cool. I'd say it made me feel uncomfortable, but in the right way. Like, yeah, I feel like whenever I read good science fiction, it's good because it left me with something to ponder and work out. Um, so I'd put it pretty high up and suggest it. I've suggested it to the economics professor at my work because I was like, this is something you will love. But yeah, I feel like it just makes me a little uncomfortable from loving it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like it. I like the, the, the topics it grapples with. I'm still completely torn on whether or not I think it's good or not. <laughs> like in a <laughs> in a like a great work kind of way. Mm. Like I still I still struggle with how it actually views technology. And maybe I'll just have to read it a few more times to see where I actually land on it, but I would suggest people read it. I would say it might be similar to Umbrella Academy because the Umbrella Academy comic is wild, but it was just okay. But then the Umbrella Academy TV show, I feel like putting it into that medium really dug into its core components a lot deeper than the book got. So maybe like a TV series or something would be a better fit. I was thinking about whether it would be feasible to adapt this into an audio drama. <clears throat> but uh... <laughs> having to explain the ads in the background. Yeah, I mean, there's ways to yeah stick that kind of thing. Hey. It is much harder to do just like background stuff in an audio drama, but you know, that's a, that's a whole different topic. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for listening to this episode of second opinion reviews. Everybody. Uh, I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck, uh, Daniel and Quentin. Where can people find you guys? You can find me on Twitter at Gwair, G Y W A I R. And I'm also on Itch.io and at Calculating Normals is my blog. And uh, I'm, I'm Quentin again. And you can find me on Twitter at Quentin Pongratz or on our other podcast where me and Daniel do fun comic book and other stuff called Double Issue. This episode is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any or all of it as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page, which, once again, is thenexus.tv slash SO102. Uh, if you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, you can go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. And uh, yeah, like Quentin mentioned during the episode, you can uh, support us financially as we continue to make technology-focused podcasts on Patreon at patreon.com slash thenexustv. 
Until next time, have a good one. Goodbye. Bye. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological Convergence. Convergence. You are about to become obsolete. You think you are special, unique, and that whatever it is that you are doing is impossible to replace. You are wrong. As we speak, millions of algorithms are frantically running on servers all over the world, with one sole purpose. Do whatever humans can do, but better. But all is not lost. Look for the audiobook, Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, at thenexus.tv, or by searching in your favorite podcast player.